Right. As we all probably know, writing tests can be, be quite hard. And um, for some reason, asynchronous, uh, asynchronous calls doesn't make it any easier. Uh, neither does view layers for some reason. So uh, hopefully this guy will help us with that. Hopefully. Welcome. Give a warm welcome. Thanks. Uh, so uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is some of the things that I've experienced. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of the things that makes uh, tests hard and really difficult to write. And it's also going to be some of the good things about tests. So just to get everyone started, I'm just going to start with an example. Uh, so this is something that happened to me. I got to work early Monday morning. Uh, I usually come first at the office. Uh, so I pulled the changes from Friday, I ran the tests, and something has failed. Kim is not very happy. Uh, <laughs> so the thing that's going through my head is just this who pushed a failing test on a Friday. Uh, so I start looking into this, just trying to understand what's going on here. So the first thing I do is check Jenkins, just to see what happened. But Jenkins is green, so our build server says that everything was fine on Friday. So I have no idea what's going on. So before we can go more into what's happening here, we need to just have some basic JavaScript tests. Uh, so just some basic knowledge. So this is a test written using Jasmine, which is one of the most used JavaScript testing libraries. Here we have a describe that is basically a grouping of tests. So here we say we have some tests that re relate to a cart. And within the describe, we can have several tests. And they're all specified here by calling it and have just some name and a function that's called. And within the function here, the test, we create a cart, we add some items, and then we expect something. So we have an asser assertion at the end. Uh, so we can also have a couple more functions. We have before each that is run before every test and after each that is run after every test. And with Jasmine, you can also group tests into subgroups. So within the describe, you can have a describe. Uh, so for example, within the second describe here, we have another before each. So that before each is for all the tests within that group. And that's basically all you need to know about how Jasmine works. So back to our test. So the first thing we need to understand here is just what's going on. So we start looking and we find the description. It might be a little hard to see here, but it says order with life insurance, with child insurance validates. Not easy to understand what's actually going on here. So I start looking into what's actually happening. And we can see that something was expected to be true, but it was false. It's still hard to understa uh, understand what's going on. So I start looking through the stack trace to see where this failed. And I can find that that happened in, it's called order spec.js on some line. So OK, I can go into that file, and I find this. And the question I always ask myself uh, first when I look at a failing test is, of course, why did it fail? And this is really hard to understand. I have no idea why, it, why this test failed. So I start looking around. So I go to the nearest before each. It's here. Um, so here we can see that we create a product. Uh, it has a type CI, which means it's child insurance. This is from uh, an insurance page that I worked on. And we add this to a cart. One of the problems here is that we don't work with the order at all. We only see that we create the product, we add it to a cart, but it was the order that was supposed to be valid. So I'm not sure what's going on here. So again, why did it fail? I have no idea. Uh, so this before each was for about five tests. Uh, so I went one group out to a before each that was for about 20 tests. This file in all had about 60 tests. And there's a lot of stuff going on here. So it creates a new product, it adds something to a cart, it updates the order. It's still not easy to understand why the test failed. And it should have been possible by now, because now when I go up to the before each for the entire file, yeah, I have no idea. 
so the, the thing is, this test is really hard to understand, and, and this test looks like most of the tests that I see when people are just getting started writing JavaScript tests. Um, and uh, in this case, after debugging for half an hour, I found a problem. It's this number. I don't know if it's the same in Sweden, but in Norway, you, calculate someone's, you can calculate someone's age from their social security number. So within here, you have the date of birth. And the problem was that this user, this test user, got too old to have child insurance. That was really hard to understand from that test. And you will at some point hate your tests. And that's an OK thing to do. Uh, it's an OK thing to, I don't know, at least realize that you hate your tests and then start working on it. I've been here so many times on my projects. And you basically see this problem when your tests start costing you a lot of time. When just debugging your tests, understanding what's going on, takes a lot of time, you start hating them. And you start not writing them, and you start ignoring them. And basically, I think we need to learn more about writing tests, and especially about how we write them, not just writing them. We can't be happy having 100% coverage. I had quite good coverage on that project, but the test was really hard to understand before we started fixing it. So before we can go more into how we should test, uh, we need to understand why we do test at all. And one reason can be because testing in production sucks. That's why. <laughs> because you want to <laughs> avoid doing that. I think it's amazing. Uh, seriously, it depends. And it really does depend. Uh, having 100% test coverage is not a goal in itself at all. Um, so to understand my perspective, I think you need to understand where I come from. So uh, I'm Kim. Uh, I work as a consultant at Beck in Oslo. So working as a consultant means that I usually work in five to ten person teams. So reasonably small teams, but I'm not alone. That's an important thing. I'm not the only one working on the tests. And I usually work on a project from about three months to several years. And this is usually for large companies, and it's usually on interactive and complex applications. So it's usually a complex domain. There's a lot of stuff going on. And this, of course, impacts how we test. And usually, when I'm finished with a project, or my company is finished with a project, we give our code to uh, the company that hired us. So that means someone else has to take over that code. Uh, so we need to think about them, too. So today, I'm going to talk partly about philosophy and partly about the techniques that I rely on now to write good tests. And I'm going to try to share some experiences that are both good and bad. So why do I test in my context? Why is it important for me? Basically, there are three things that I need to think about. One is regressions. Just if, so when we have been working on this application for two years and we do some changes, I don't want to be afraid of something failing on me that I don't know about. So the thing is, we're building more of these complex and interactive applications, especially the last like, three to five years, after Google Maps, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and things like this. Uh, we've been working on more like, heavier front-end applications than before. Before, we usually rendered everything on the back end. Now we do a lot of uh, things on the front end. We often work in larger teams. There's seldom just one JavaScript guy that fixes everything on the front end now, because the applications are too big. Often on my applications, we see 30 to 50% JavaScript. And I want to be uh, less afraid of changing code, and especially less afraid of changing other people's code. And also because debugging and production sucks, and I want to uh, get away from, I don't know, I really don't want to do this because this is painful, especially with JavaScript, because you don't have logging the same way you have in Java. And I also want to be able to fix a bug once. So if something happens in production, fix it, uh, create a test for it, and not have that problem again. The next thing for me is communication. 
And one of the things that happens a lot is, why did we do it like this? Half a year after you fix something, and you need to go into this big, complex domain and understand precisely what's going on, uh, this is an important thing for your test to answer. Why uh, do we actually do it like this? And also, what should the code actually do? And third is design. I want to have immediate feedback. So when I do something, I want to know uh, right away that it worked. I can refresh in my browser. Uh, that works when I precisely the moment where I'm developing, but it doesn't help six months down the line when I'm trying to understand what's happening. So immediate feedback is important for me, and it, I think it helps me keep the code simple. When I don't follow, when I don't test, I tend to create more complex code. Um, yeah, so that's basically my three reasons, primary reasons for testing. So what is the problem for me? It's just that it's very easy to write really bad tests. And that's what I'm going to try to focus on for the rest of the talk, how I try to write my code. And I think an important thing is try to, because I think this is hard, even though there's a lot of just basic ideas here, um, and it seems simple, it's really hard to actually do this. And if you work in Java, you also know this, it's hard to write good tests. So that's not a pure JavaScript phenomenon. It's uh, also the same thing in Java and whatever else front-end or back-end language you're working on. So to me, uh, this has changed quite a bit over the years, especially as I've been working in uh, teams with more front-end people or more people working on the front-end code. It's I need to focus on the reader, focus on having a readable code because you spend more time reading code than writing code. And especially in a team, you spend a lot of time reading other people's code. And it might be that the first time you meet a failing test is, or the first time you meet some code is when the test fails. So you have to go in there 7 a.m. Monday morning and try to understand what's going on. And uh, one of the things for me is that I try to keep the setup as small as possible. We saw the before each methods uh, that we had in our example. I try to stay away from having setup as much as possible. If you can get totally away from it, that's good. Uh, because this is basically hidden code, so you have to go looking for it, uh, because it's not clear what's going on when you're inside the test. And people tend to, cry, uh, tend to call this dry. But dry isn't always the answer, because there's a difference here in drawing up lines, uh, just lines of code, and drawing up concepts. So usually, when you see two lines that are similar in two tests, you tend to like, move that to the before each, or the setup, and you're happy because you've dried up the code. The problem is that you've just moved some lines around. You haven't collected this, component or this concept into one function that you can call. And I think this is a good way to think about it. Uh, because now, in your test, when you have a lot of setup, and you need to follow the setup uh, like several steps up, it's a lot of conceptual overhead. It takes a lot of time to understand what's going on. So for me, instead of moving everything to a setup, um, I have creation helpers. So it looks like this. So this is basically the same test that we saw in the beginning. Um, and it says that uh, this order is valid when a policy holder is young enough. So here I create an order with a child insurance, and I create a policy holder that is 14, not 15. That's the age limit. And then I can inspect the order to be valid. So if someone changes the rule somewhere in the code, so that, okay, now a user has to be at most 13 to have child insurance. Uh, it's really easy for me to understand that in this test. I don't have to go looking for that social security number that is 11 digits long um, and try to understand what's going on. So uh, this might seem like copying lines of code because you usually have something similar in a lot of tests. So this is the next test when 
the um, user is just uh, 15, so just uh, too old to have child insurance. So but even though this seems like copying code and not drawing up everything, this is so much easier to understand. And here you actually call a function instead of relying on somewhere else something is set up. And also create these creation helpers with good defaults. Looking back here, I don't have to specify everything. I don't have to specify name for the policy holder. I don't have to specify address and everything else that you usually need to specify. That's all defaults. So all the places I accept uh, a JavaScript object as input where I can set keys like here, type, age, and things like that, or cart and policy holder. And now this create order function uh, creates everything that I haven't set specifically. And with these good defaults, it's really easy to read the tests and you reveal your intent so you really show what you're actually intending to test. So you don't need a lot of, or you shouldn't have code within your test that doesn't do anything towards that test. So if you, I ever had a name inside my validation test, it wouldn't matter because I'm not testing that. Uh, so there's less things for me, fewer things for me to actually look at when I'm trying to debug and understand what's going on. So what are we testing here? This happens, if you don't think about it, you end up doing this. I do this all the time when I'm not thinking about revealing intent, because this is so hard to understand. Now I have to go looking for order, and especially if you have more than one before each, you need to understand, you need to follow along that path to understand the state of this object. So focus on why, not how in these, um, when you reveal intent. <clears throat> so another thing, and this goes back to the example, it needs to be deterministic. You, don't, you can't have tests that fail sometimes, but not other times. For example, if you rely on dates, that's a perfect time to, or that's when you start failing. That's when you start failing at random times. And remember, this one, this number, 11 digit number that is somewhere inside my tests that suddenly starts breaking my tests. This is really hard to uh, understand. So we need to focus on having our tests deterministic. Otherwise you have it, oh, it's Monday, so it fails. Or it's, um, it's uh, February 29th, so it fails. Every fourth year that test fails. And then suddenly you start not looking that much on your test failures. So you accept that your test doesn't run some days. Yeah, of course, daylight saving times is, uh, it, that just actually happened to me like a month ago. <laughs> or two months ago. So yeah, it happens. <laughs> um, and another thing, uh, no conditionals. I talked just a little bit about conceptual overhead. And as soon as you're having for, if, and whiles inside your tests, it's really hard to understand what's going on. So this is just an example of something. I, um, I, had, I wanted to show a date, and it was supposed to say midnight, then 12.01 a.m., 1 a.m., and so on, until noon, and then p.m. for everything, just because 12 uh, p.m., 12 a.m. is hard to understand if it's midnight or noon. So we could create a test like this. So here, we loop through all the minutes of a day, and then we create a date, and then we can create an event with this date. And then, when we read out this date from the event, it's supposed to be midnight, noon, or be formatted correctly. Can anyone spot the bug? I don't think anyone's, uh, anyone has uh, done this yet. Um, basically, this is seconds, not minutes up here. So you have a year, a month, date, an hour, minute, seconds, and milliseconds. So the thing is, this actually runs through 24 minutes, not 24 hours. So you never test noon. It never happens. But that's basically impossible to know, because you actually have expectations in here, and they are run, you know that. Uh, so this tests midnight, and it tests uh, the formatting for the first 24 minutes of the day. 
So changing this to creation helpers, we could have something like this. Here we say create date. So it's uh, noon and it's midnight. And I can also test a couple of random dates, uh, times throughout the day. So you don't need to loop through all of the minutes of the day to actually test this. Test especially the corner cases. Those are always interesting. So try to think about what's the corner case uh, in this test. And you don't only, the, or uh, not only test um, the right way things are supposed to happen, also test it the wrong way. So what do you expect it, when do you expect it to fail? And next thing is that functional code is easier to test. Functional code basically means that you have code with no uh, dependencies except the things that you give uh, your function. So yeah, it's only the parameters. So the same input always give the same output. Uh, and this is often easier when you separate uh, the DOM from your logic. So usually if you have this big application that's using jQuery or something like that, and you have complex tests where you do a lot of DOM stuff and a lot of uh, domain stuff at the same time, it's really hard to understand what's going on. And they break really easily. easily. So this means that you shouldn't put so much code inside your backbone views, your Angular directives, or your React components, or whatever you use. Try to move your logic out into a separate file. Call it whatever you want. In Angular, they usually call them services. Uh, in backbone, it might be a model. Uh, but it can basically be a pure JavaScript function. And this becomes very obvious when you test. Because if you don't test, it's so easy to put everything inside here. So I'm not talking about TDD, like test driven development. I'm just talking about actually testing your code. It can be before, it can be after, uh, whenever. Uh, but as soon as you start testing, you see that this is a big problem. So try to keep the DOM and the logic separated. That way you can also keep your DOM test super simple if you need to test your DOM. Often, I tend to not test my DOM that much, but focus on testing the logic. And that also makes the test really fast. You can have thousands, uh, thousands of tests running in less than a second easily if you don't have a lot of DOM tests. And an important thing, especially with JavaScript, when you have asynchronous code, is seeing it fail. Uh, so let's see here if this works. Did it start? Yeah. So here I have a test. It runs. I change the expectation. And then I refresh. Everything runs. Change the expectation again. Everything runs. So the thing is, this is asynchronous. And as soon as we say that we're finished with our tests, we will see it fail. And the reason is that the expectation here, uh, expect player count done to be three, uh, when this is asynchronous, this is called outside uh, Jasmine, basically. So if this throws an error, Jasmine doesn't know about it. So you might have seen this in the console. If you open the console to debug this, you would have seen it fail. Um, but here, as soon as it's inside Jasmine, Jasmine doesn't know. Everything looks green. Everyone's happy. Nothing works. So async tests need to tell when they're done. This has been one of the major complaints against um, Jasmine, is that they're not so focused on this. There's a lot of other libraries that are more focused on this, and Jasmine has gotten better at this. And this is an important thing to remember, that the most important thing your tests do is fail. That's the, the one thing it's supposed to do. And if it doesn't fail, it might have helped you design the program. It might communicate what it's supposed to do. Uh, but at the same time, you feel, uh, you think that everything's working fine, but it, it doesn't necessarily work. So keep this in mind at all times that it should fail or it should fail at the right time and you should be able to understand why it failed. So beware of this async tests. Uh, it can be hard to know when they actually fail. And especially when you go from Java to JavaScript, 
this is a difficult thing to understand because the testing, uh, testing in general is much better in Java still, far better. Uh, so the tools are getting there in JavaScript, but we're not quite there yet. And an important thing, but in a test, always follow this. Always arrange, then act on it, and then assert at the end. You can skip one of these, preferably not the last one, uh, but uh, you can skip, for example, if you don't need to act. If you're checking uh, the default setup of a cart, you can only create a cart and then assert. But try to follow this, and in the beginning, especially when you have new developers, uh, it can be a good thing to just specifically demand that uh, you comment in, uh, arrange, act, assert in your test for the first couple of days. Uh, so just to get used to thinking this way. And I try to keep it at one assertion per test. Uh, if you have 20 assertions, it can be hard to understand what's going on again. That usually means that your test is too complex and hard to understand. So I prefer to have one or two assertions in a test and prefer to keep them at the bottom of your test so it's easier to understand why it failed. And perhaps most importantly, tests should be stupidly simple. Um, th so that means no uh, conditionals, no for and if. Uh, that means it has to be very focused, it has to be understandable, and it should be, or this is a good way to think about it, what happens when we don't understand our own tests? And when they take 30 minutes to debug just to understand why it failed, that's not a good place to be. And this is basically my thing. I try to write tests that I'd be happy to debug myself. So, and on to the next thing then, so now we've been through like writing tests, how to write tests. Now we start to need uh, no. Now we start to uh, need to maintain our tests. So after it's written, we need to still keep it going, not just re um, uh, neglect it. Poor quality tests, they tend to slow down uh, development. So in the beginning, they can really help, but six months in or a year in, you have 700 tests. And it's really hard to work. It can be so hard to work uh, with the tests if you don't think about them a lot. Uh, I think it's really important just to feel the pain, and if it doesn't feel good, try to fix it. If it takes half an hour to debug every week, uh, it's time to start fixing them, or just delete them. Uh, if you don't have value in your tests, they're they aren't supposed to be there. You can just delete them. So the same way you actually refactor your code often, you need to refactor your tests. So people tend to focus on the quality of the code, but not the quality of the tests. And this is a big problem if you have more tests than you have code. Uh, before, I used to show people how many tests we had and how good they were and how many lines and everything, but it's a stupid metric because let's say that you have 15,000 lines of test and 5,000 lines of code. Uh, I've seen this happen quite a few times in JavaScript. Uh, and the problem now is that if you only maintain those 5,000 lines of code, but not those 15, things become very painful very fast. Uh, so you need to focus on the tests at least as much as you focus on the actual code. Uh, so, lately, I've been writing, I know, less tests, but try to focus on the most important areas. So instead of just having a lot of tests, and especially a lot of unit tests, uh, which can be very, very focused, but also make the, car, uh, the code hard to work with, I tend to focus on uh, creating functions that are pure, that take some input, returns the same output all the time, and I try to test them really good. So uh, this means, at least for me, less testing of the DOM and less unit testing on everything. I try to focus on a few things and really test them. Uh, because we need to think about what the cost is and what the actual value is. And especially 
after the test is written, it can be really easy to uh, say, that, okay, we need to do test-driven development. So we do test-driven development all the time. We create a lot of tests. But it's, in the end, it's perhaps hard work with the tests. It can be hard to uh, refactor the code. It can be hard to do larger architectural changes on the code. Um, so I think that TDD can work. I think that um, it needs, or you need to work a lot with it, and you uh, need to focus a lot on them on after a test is written. So just basically maintaining it, and don't focus so much on the dogma. So people say that you need to TDD everything. You need to uh, have uh, all of these types of tests. So you need um, integration tests. You need unit tests. You need everything. Uh, don't focus too much on that. Focus on writing great tests that work on your projects. And this takes time to learn when to write them and when not to write them. And basically, in the JavaScript world at least, we're still learning how. Uh, so this is the important place for the backend developers to uh, share their experience. Because usually backend developers have way more knowledge about tests because um, we basically have five to ten years more experience writing tests in Java than in JavaScript. Uh, so at least we see that in our consultancy is that the last couple of years we have a lot more Java and C Sharp developers contributing uh, on the front end and specifically on architecture, testing and things like that. And that's a very, very good thing because a lot of front end developers if they haven't been through the back end, they might not be used to building apps in this way. So it's different than the way we did before when it was just about having these smooth interactions and things like that. Now, if you have 40,000 lines of code, you really need, uh, really need to think about architecture. You really need to think about maintaining your code. And really don't accept Incompre incomprehensible tests. Uh, if a test is hard to understand, either fix it or delete it. It's okay. Deleting a test is not necessarily a problem. And keep them simple, really simple. And I really think that tests can be awesome and that we need to experiment to get there. We need to keep what works, but also throw away the things that don't work. So in my teams, we often talk about how a test feels. Is this okay? Is this hard to understand? Uh, or especially if I'm debugging someone else's test, or someone else is debugging my test, um, it can be interesting discussions. So uh, think about how we can increase the value in our tests, because the tests in themselves don't have any value. They have value when they actually give value in your project. So basically, to me, a beautiful test depends it depends on the project, it depends on the situa situation. But basically, it needs to be fast, uh, it needs to fail, and especially when it should, and not when it shouldn't, so it needs to be deterministic. And it needs to be understandable and reveal an intent, otherwise it's, it doesn't give any value. And also try to focus on the reader and be maintainable. I should be able to change some code or change the test and then see that the test fails, fix some code, and see that everything works again. And try to stay away from setup. Basically, focus on the craft and not the tools. People tend to ask me, okay, should I use Jasmine? Should I use uh, some other test library? Jest, should I use uh, so any of these? Um, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that your team uh, agrees and that your team enjoys working with this test library. So, this is basically my, the thing that I think about when I test. So, if you want to learn more, these are four very good resources that have helped me quite a bit. Especially this book, oh, it's really hard to read. It's called JavaScript Testing Recipes. That's a really good book and it's quite new. And you also have the two books at the top. Growing object-oriented software and working effectively with unit tests are, I think they're Java-based, both of them, but they're still very good books to just learn about tests 
So it doesn't matter if the examples are in Java. So that's everything for me. And if you have some questions, you can just come up here afterwards. I think it's so hard for everyone to hear when people ask questions. So. <laughs>